Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters, our family of presenters, I should say. I'd like to thank John, Tyler, and Kim for joining us today. Dr. Kimberly Morell is an Associate Professor of Dermatology and Pediatrics at Columbia University Medical Center. She joined the staff of New York Presbyterian Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital in 2003. Dr. Morell received her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and her medical degree from SUNY Health Science Center in Brooklyn, New York. Dr. Morell directs the pediatric epidermolysis bullosa. Did I get that right, Kim? Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. Interdisciplinary Clinic at Columbia. Dr. Morell is a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology and the American Academy of Pediatrics. She's a member of the Society for Pediatric Dermatology, Hemangioma Investigator Group. Here I go again, the Epidermolysis Bellosa Clinical Research Consortium, and she's on the Executive Committee of the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance. And Tyler Longo is a high school student in the Princeton, New Jersey area. He's enrolled in the Introduction to Business, Finance, and Economic Summer Program for high school students at Columbia University. He is currently working on a book related to financial literacy and investing. And last but certainly not least, Dr. John Longo has appeared on CNBC, Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, Fox Business, BBC World. I think I need a I think I need a rest right now. <laughs> <laughs> WallStreetJournal.com, Green Investors TV. I could go on and on. Um, uh, he has also led the Rutgers students um, to a personal visit. One of my fascinating things that I know about John Longo, he's led this group of students to a personal visit with Warren Buffett in Omaha, Nebraska on four separate occasions. Previously, he was vice president at Merrill Lynch and Company Incorporated and served on the advisory board of Bloomberg's educational subsidiary, the Bloomberg Institute. He is a professor um, of professional practice in the finance and economics department at Rutgers Business School and the chief investment officer and portfolio manager for Beacon Trust. So it is now my pleasure, John, to hand things over to you. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks everyone for joining us. Probably like you, we're kind of working from home today, so we thought it might be a good idea to get the whole family involved. And as the name indicates, we're going to talk about things related to health and wealth. So in a minute, I'm going to pass it to Kim and we certainly welcome your questions and comments. Now, of course, I got to start with the standard disclaimer that we're kind of here for educational purposes only. We're not giving formal medical or investment advice. Um, and with that little disclaimer, let me kind of pass it to Kim. We'll move on to the health portion of our talk. Yes, thank you for that very nice introduction. I'm happy to be here today talking to you about the health portion of this health and wealth talk. So this first slide is just a very comprehensive slide from the Centers of Disease Control uh, that talks about on top here factors involved in the community spread and individual risk of COVID-19. And then a slide that shows about uh, risk factors for having more severe disease, um, which involved not only obesity, but multiple medical conditions increasing a person's risk of having a more severe disease leading to hospitalization. And what I wanted to focus first on was the actions to reduce risk. Even if you don't have other underlying medical conditions, it's really still important to protect our neighbors and uh, be careful about preventing um, this disease. So let's focus first on wearing a mask. So um, it has certainly been shown to make a difference in the spread. This is just one graph from an, from an city in Germany where they mandated, not only recommended, but mandated mask wearing in this city compared to the neighboring cities, all other factors the same, they were really able to halt the new infection rate of COVID-19. So it really makes a difference. And why is it, in, and not all masks though are created equal. If we could have it um, my way, everyone would have access to one of these um, very expensive powered air purifying respirators on the left. Um, they're um, pricey and reserved for only certain medical centers for healthcare providers um, doing aerosolase generating procedures may be using them. Versus on the right is a YouTube video one of my colleagues had done about um, 
making an inexpensive folded thick cotton material using safety pins and rubber bands um, to make a mask and the do's and don'ts of wearing it. So a thousand dollar approximately price differential between the two. So um, why is it important to wear a mask? This is just a visual representation of your cough jet. This is a person coughing on the top without a mask. Um, and two seconds later, and then up here, up to a minute later, 12 feet away, those, those respiratory droplets are still lingering in the air away from that person. Um, and then here is the same representation just with the person wearing, this is a folded thin handkerchief, which is you know not very good for preventing the cough jet, um, but shortens the distance of that, those respiratory droplets somewhat. And then down here, this is a folded cotton thicker mask where the distance can, where the cough jet is contained is two and a half inches around the person even um, a couple of seconds later. So again, not all masks are created equal. You may have seen this Duke University study where they looked at a variety of masks, 14 different masks, and had a person just talk through the mask and counted the respiratory droplets that came through the mask. So of course the fitted N95 mask is ideal and we wish we all could have them, but they're certainly still um, in short supply and doctors have to wear them for um, not just one patient, but between multiple patients covered by another mask or a face shield to keep them clean throughout the day between patients. Um, and then they tested a variety of other materials. And you can see um, that many of them did a, a pretty good job. So more feasible for the general population to be wearing their folded multi-layer cotton masks. Compared to what was interesting, if you look at the right, um, knitted cottons were not as good as other cottons and bandanas also not really much better than not wearing a mask. Um, and then what they found um, was the fleece masks were actually, um, he said worse, the droplet count actually increased. Um, the thought being that it is decreasing the size of your respiratory block uh, droplets, so not only not blocking them, but making them smaller, and the thought is they linger in the air longer. So the bottom line, best covering for nose and mouth um, for general day-to-day -day use, multi-layer with a thick thread count, um, fitted to your face with uh, ideally adjustable straps and um, a nose wire guard to keep it in place, wash regularly. Um, I've been seeing a lot of ac increasing acne rates in people who are wearing their masks in the heat for longer periods of time than they should. So, so washing the, your mask regularly is important and avoid fleece as we talked about. Okay, and then moving on to vaccines. When can we stop this mask wearing? We certainly need a good preventive vaccine before that can happen. Um, so this is just um, a big slide table of all the vaccines that are being developed. There's a number, as people have said, a lot of shots on goal and lots of money invested into trying to come up with an effective and safe vaccine. You see many have already started phase three trials, um, and you may have even seen some advertisements for a COVID vaccine um, trials where they're looking for um, people to be uh, to test the vaccine on. Um, this is one website COVID vaccine study where you can go on and see if you can be eligible for a trial and enter near you. There's another website clinicaltrials.gov that also has all of the trials that are under study that you can take a look at. All right, so that was a, a bit about COVID-19. Now let's talk about how we can keep ourselves healthier longer. So as a dermatologist, I'm often asked, what can I do for my skin to protect it and stay healthier looking longer? So the first thing we'll talk about in this um, aspect of good long-term health is sun protection. So here is just a primer. You may all know there's various types of ultraviolet light. So this cartoon shows the ultraviolet C light on the right blocked by the ozone layer, fortunately. And then ultraviolet B on the left that is filtered a little bit by clouds, but not fully. And this is the ultraviolet light that causes sunburn. 
And then there's ultraviolet A, and this, is, this wavelength disregards those clouds, goes right through, and is the type of light that is more involved in photoaging, wrinkling, and future risk of skin cancer. Um, this next slide shows you how that UVB that causes sunburns is blocked a bit by your outer skin layer. And then these are the deeper layers of your skin. And you see how that ultraviolet A just penetrates all the way through. So again, affecting more of the those cells in the dividing layer of your skin. And again, affecting our future risks of wrinkling and skin cancer. So important to protect against these rains. So I've got a pre-test question here. So Margaret, if you can help set up the poll, this is a question on uh, which active sunscreen ingredient protects against the broadest range of ultraviolet light? Is it A, avobenzone, B, homosalate, C, octinoxate, D, oxybenzone, or E, zinc oxide? I'm glad I don't have to answer this question. That's pretty hard. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to pronounce those for you. <laughs> um, so we do have people weighing in, and so far, zinc oxide is way ahead. Very All right. good. All right. So tell me when we're ready to move to the next slide on that one. You're going to reveal the answer? Oh, yeah. yeah. So this, I'm not sure if you can see this, but 85%. Oh, I didn't see it. 85% yeah, said zinc oxide and 15% said oxybenzone. Okay, so we'll show you the answer here. So the answer to this one, most of you got it right, is zinc oxide. So zinc oxide is a physical barrier against the sun and blocks the broadest range of ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A rays. So the chemical sunscreens, many of them protect against the B rays some protect against A and B, but not as wide of a range as that zinc oxide. Avobenzone just protects A, so you're going to see never it's never going to be the lone ingredient in your sunscreen. It's always going to be used in combination with other sunscreens. So why is it important that we're, we're asking about this? There's studies under uh, underway now looking at um, how much of these chemical sunscreens we're absorbing in our skin. Um, so exa for example, this is a study that looked at volunteers applying chemical sunscreens on their skin. Um, and even after one application to a large body surface area, they were able to find measurable blood levels in their skin. This dark line at the bottom is the level that the FDA says, okay, if you're below this, we don't have to study. It's a very low level. Anything above um, the companies are required to do more safety studies to evaluate what's happening when these chemicals are in our bloodstream. Um, so you can see, even when they stopped applying the sunscreen after four days, the measurable levels were still in the volunteer's bloodstream three weeks later, okay? And why is this important? Um, one is that there's research, so it's much higher levels than are measured, but there is research that certain of the chemical sunscreens do have effects on our hormone system. So that is um, some studies underway. Um, and the other thing that's important is also for an env our environment. Um, it is known that certain chemical sunscreens can affect the coral reefs. And so Hawaii, for example, has gone so far as to ban these two ingredients. Starting in 2021, they will not be allowed to be used, um, again, because of their effects on the uh, that are researched on the coral reefs. So if that wasn't enough to convince you to find other ways besides chemical sunscreens to protect your skin from the sun, I'm hoping that my niece and nephew modeling their sun protective clothing does. So um, here they are wearing their hats, their sunglasses, their swim shirts. So they're really able to readily protect their skin, most of their skin from the sun that way. Um, without using sunscreens. And then in the areas that are uncovered, um, I like to teach people to be label readers. So don't only look at the front of your sunscreen bottle and what it says, um, but turn it around and look at that active ingredient section. Does it have the five chemical sunscreens in it or does it have the zinc oxide as the active ingredient in the sunscreen, for example? And then using that to the uncovered areas of your skin and reapplying is a, is a good way to protect from your skin from the sun. So again, uh, the, the 
bottom line also is that we know that ultraviolet light is a carcinogen for our skin. So if this is all you have, um, it is still, unless you're going to Hawaii, still an appropriate um, sunscreen to use. But again, re more research is underway. So other things you can do to protect your skin, as you all know, avoid the peak hours of sun exposure. Um, read those active ingredients. Look for an SPF 30 to 50. Look for water-resistant 80-minute labeling. It's just going to stay on your skin and protect you longer and read about the re reapplying. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about in, in establishing good long-term health is about um, some research about the blue zones. You may have um, heard about that. Researchers looked at the areas of the world that had the highest level of centenarians are people who live to 100 and beyond and found that areas um, including Sardinia, Italy, in Greece, Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, California, and Nicoya, Costa Rica had a higher percentage of people living longer, healthier lives. Um, and they looked further into what um, peoples in these regions were doing in terms of how they were moving, what their social systems looked like, um, what their outlook on life was, and how they were um, eating. So a couple of kind of take home points were that in their diet, for example, of course, many of these places they were eating locally sourced fresh foods as opposed to processed foods. Um, Sardinia, Italy, interestingly, they're, as opposed to the US diet, which is sort of um, carb phobic and get all the protein you can, um, people there were eating higher carb rate in their fresh pastas um, and relatively lower protein in their diets. Drinking wine, of course, in moderation, but one or two glasses a day was part of their general diet. Um, and then, for example, Okinawa, Japan, as you may know, their um, diet intake of fatty fish, fish is higher and green tea, which is felt to have anti-inflammatory effects on our system, um, were also something that was a regular part of the diet. And common to all, um, people would move naturally and move naturally longer, not go to the gym. Um, there, Elderly patients were active and remained engaged in the family and social system, which was an important part of overall long-term health. So one question that came about as I was uh, researching this topic are what are foods that are higher in levels of omega-3 fatty acids? So here's a list of foods here that include those fatty fishes, certain seeds, walnuts, soybeans, even algae oil. Um, so my next question, um, to pull the audience is which of these omega-3 fatty acids, um, because the, the three in the, the omega stands for the three components of the fatty acids, which are the to abbreviate EPA, DHA, and ALA, which of these is reported to have the most protective effects on cardiovascular health? Is it A, the EPA, B, the DHA, Oops, C, sorry, they all say A, but they should say A, B, and C, ALA, or D, I have no idea. So if you can answer in the poll, let's see what people know. So a lot of people have no idea. So far, that's in the lead. <laughs> Very um, good. But but after that, DHA is um, a close a close second. So we'll give okay. people another second or so to weigh in, and then I'll close it and show you the results. Okay. Okay. So um, fifty percent. No idea. DHA, 39%. Um, ALA, 11%. And no one thought EPA was it. Interestingly. Okay. So that, so last week, I'll tell you, I said I have no, I, I would have said I have no idea because you hear about, oh, you should have more omega-3 in your diet. Um, but more research has been underway. Oop, let me get back to that section. Um, the answer actually, there's been more research that EPA is the, the best of the omega-3s. Um, to, you know, ALA is is an omega-3, but it's it's apparently more difficult for our bodies to process into the DHA and EPA, especially as we age. Um, DHA has been um, 
certainly proven to lower triglycerides, but more research shows that maybe it increases our LDL levels. Um, and then there's actually a prescription medicine um, that is a purified form of a fish oil high in the EPA component that is proven to significantly reduce cardiovascular res risk in adults who even had prior cardiovascular events and were needing to take a statin. This in conjunction um, proved to have um, lower risks. So I found that, so I learned something out of um, giving this talk. Um, so the bottom line is when you want to have more of those EPA omega-3s in your diet, the, the fatty fishes were the highest um, in those EPAs. Um, salmon and then certain other um, fishes, sardines, herring, oysters, anchovies, caviar, those were the highest in the EPA component. Um, and then what do you do if you're not a fish eater and you want to take a supplement? You know, research is underway. The studies are ongoing with using the amount of 1,000 milligrams a day of omega-3s. And again, here's where you need to be a re label reader. Um, look at whether you whether the supplement has EPA, DHA, or mostly ALA. Um, and we just did a sort of a price comparison on different brands. And I think it was the, let's see, um, no conflicts of interest to disclose the Omega Via had the highest percentage of EPA per dollar, for example. Um, but as as my disclaimer goes, definitely um, don't just go out and take an omega-3 without talking to your doctor. They, especially at higher doses, increase your risk of bleeding. And anyone who's on a blood thinner, such as Coumadin, is, is told not to take one of these omega-3 supplements. So it is something to be talking about. So speaking about money, let's pass it back to my uh, husband who will take over onto the wealth portion of the talk. Thanks, Kim. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the market now, and then we'll kind of, Tyler and I will discuss maybe some principles of building long-term wealth. And I'm not sure what's in your portfolio, but if you have technology, it's probably in a pretty good year. So as you can see, it's kind of a mixed bag. NASDAQ is a well-known technology index. You've probably heard of the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. They're pretty strongly. So growth and technology is up roughly 30%. You have gold, that's also up pretty strongly. Uh, market as a whole is kind of flattish, depending upon which index you look at. And then certain other pockets of the market, small cap value, they're down. MSCI is an international index. And as you probably know, interest rates are really low. So it's actually good if you had a bond portfolio in the beginning of the year, kind of bad now that you're getting nothing uh, for fixed income investments. And I do have one kind of macro indicator here, crude oil. Crude oil is one of the most important kind of commodities for the economy. And you can see that it's down like 26%. So one thing that we can touch upon later is that there's kind of a disconnect between what's happening in the economy where there's still a lot of you know, turmoil and what's happening with the stock market. Now there's a lot going on in this graph, but most of us with our investment portfolio, especially if you have access to equities, are concerned about a bear market. So just in case you wind up on jeopardy, the distinction between a bull and bear market, historically, a bear fights with its claws in a downward direction. So bear market is, is down. And a bull fights with its horns in an upward direction. So bull market is up. In terms of numbers, it's usually a 20% or more drop would be considered a bear market. So Looking at the bottom here, this is the quickest bear market we had on record. The market really plummeted dramatically in, in March and April. And you know, I'm actually surprised how quickly it recovered. As I said a moment ago, the market is actually in positive territory year to date. So in almost every instance, a bear market was set off by a recession. In, in our case, currently, we had the COVID-19 pandemic that resulted in a recession. And that's kind of just some perspective. So because it happened so quickly, maybe we recovered so quickly. But the average bear market lasts a little bit less than two years, and you're down about 40% top to bottom. Now, another question I get asked is, you know, what's going to happen with the election? Of course, nobody knows. But what I can say, if you look on the right here, is that volatility is probably going to pick up. So volatility can work both ways, uh, movements up or down. Usually it's down. And this is kind of like before and after the election. So we're almost in September. So I would expect volatility to start picking up significantly at some point next month and continue at least a few weeks after the election. 
if you're a long-term investor, you don't have to worry about anything. If you're worried about putting money into the market, well, I would suggest maybe being cautious or what you can do is dollar cost average in, kind of leg in and leg out. So just buckle up, it could be a bumpy ride. At the left-hand side of the screen, we have kind of the post-World War II area or really Vietnam and beyond, what happened to the market. And I guess the takeaway is no matter who wins, the market tends to go up. The market kind of adjusts. And if anything, you can see over here, the market kind of likes what we call a split Congress or a gridlock, that the market tends to be more efficient in getting things done and having things legislated. So bottom line, I, I wouldn't let your political outlook cloud your investment outlook. Over the long run, the market tends to go up regardless of which party will win. Now I'm going to pass it to Tyler, who's going to talk about a combination of both COVID and financial markets. Yeah, so we talked a lot about the health side of COVID, but I'll be talking about the effects it's had on the stock market and the economy in general. So first to answer any questions about this, we have to understand one vital concept. How do we measure COVID? So a lot of websites, a lot of sources will be showing you that blue line. And this is, it's labeled confirmed infections. And these are people who've gotten tested and had positive results, which are confirmed with the United States government. Though a lot of statisticians say this is not very accurate because our testing capabilities are nowhere near, we're, we're nowhere near they are now back in April when the peak really was. So in March 30th, that was predicted to have been the peak of the pandemic. Only around 20,000 people actually had positive tests, though many assume that the number was likely over 200,000. So this is less than 10% of people were confirmed. Well, now the number is over half of people. So there's that same gray line, estimated infections, which is calculated by an algorithm. And the green represents the S&P 500 index. So as you can see, the relationship between these two variables starts out to seem inverse as the market as COVID cases went up, the market plummeted and COVID went back down, the market went up. But as COVID hits a second wave in June and July, the market still goes up. And this is perhaps a result of what Dan Ariely, an economist, he calls it the decoy effect. So we'll be sending out a poll on which of these three magazine subscriptions would you choose? Uh, you, you could get the $59 option, which is an online one or $125 for a paper subscription or $125 subscription for both the paper and online. So we might see the decoy effect in action. Let's uh, see what the results are. Results are definitely coming in. It looks like we have some thrifty folks so far who are buying only the online subscription. Um, let's give people another second or so, and then I'll close it and share out the results. Okay, so a whopping 81% are interested in the online only subscription, and then it's split evenly between print and print and online at one, uh, 125, Amazing. the 10% each, sorry. Okay, so I guess this audience didn't fall for the decoy effect, but when the study was initially done, the vast majority of people actually chose the print and web subscription, which would likely have not been the case if the print subscription wasn't included as a decoy. So how do we see the decoy effect in the stock market? Well, we see it present itself in another way. And that is the market isn't actually reacting to the sheer number of COVID cases, but rather the acceleration of COVID cases, which could be measured in estimated infections per day squared. And for the most part, COVID has been statistically quite predictable. A lot of points are in the middle. Aside from a couple in the bottom right, those are in early March when COVID was quickly accelerating and the stock market plummeted, as well as a couple in the top left representing the weeks in late March when COVID was still increasing, but it was flattening out and the market interpreted that as a good sign. So 
growth first value is another trend that investors are keeping an eye on recently. So growth stocks, those are those that investors are willing to pay a high price for due to high expectations about the company's future. While value, those stocks, the expectations aren't as high and the, the prices are lower as a result. So over the last decade, growth has been significantly outperforming value. And this may have something to do with the placebo effect. So a study was done in which patients received this fake medication. They called it Velodone RX. And some got it for $2.50. Others got it for just 10 cents. So patients who paid a higher price for it actually reported a higher amount of satisf satisfaction with the medication since the high price created an illusion that the medication had higher quality. And growth stocks might be similar to that $2.50 Belladone RX pill since they have high PE ratios, high prices, and a lot of people misinterpret that as meaning higher quality, even though this very often isn't the case. I'll hand it back to my dad who will explain more about investor psychology. Thanks, Tyler. My polling question is probably the easiest of the day. <laughs> Which orange circle do you think is bigger? The one on the right or the left? So Margaret, if you can please launch the poll. Yeah, we have people weighing in already. And so far we have most people on the side of neither being the, that they're both the same okay. size and a few people saying the one on the right. Okay. Let's uh, give people another second, then I'll close it up. Oh, somebody said they can't see it. I guess I have to cover that back um, by closing it. Okay. Me... All right, and I'm gonna share the results with you. 92% said they're both the same size and 8% said the one on the right. No one thought it was the one on the left. Yeah, well, I mean, the audience of course is right and you can surmise that I, I posed this question for a reason and the point is this, most of us, when we invest, we make mistakes. We have what's called an investor biases as part of market psychology. And it's just the way our brain is wired. So you probably selected the same size because you know I'm kind of doing this talk, but if, if you had no idea and didn't have a ruler, most people would say the thing on the right. So why this is important is that investor mistakes or biases or psychology wind, wind up hurting your investment performance. Here's a study by JP Morgan over a 20 year period. And what you can notice is that the average investor on the right here in orange is earning only about 3% per year, which is amazing because if you simply buy and hold uh, the S&P or gold or even bonds, you'd wind up way ahead. So you might say, what's going on here? So clearly some of it might be fees, but the main thing is that people chase investment performance. Think about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin was about $20,000 a coin in the end of 2018, then it plummeted to less than 6,000 a coin. Now it's back over 10,000. So what the average person on the street does is they chase hot performance. And then when that hot dot, so to speak, inevitably cools down, they compound their mistakes by selling at the bottom. So if this is you, the simple advice is just to simply buy and hold an index fund and ride out the ups and downs. Uh, that's kind of the takeaway. But the bottom line is that investment biases really hurt performance. Now let's kind of talk a little bit about some principles of building long-term wealth. And I'm sure you've all heard that it's important to start early and things like that. But let me just give you a, a numerical example. We have two people saving for retirement that want to retire at age 65. We have a young person age 25 that's able to scrape away $5,000 a year and save that each year. So $5,000 might be a lot if you're a new college grad first starting to save, but obviously once you get in, into your career, it should be within the realm of everyone. And let's assume that person invests their money in an index fund. And if you're not a student of market history, this equities in the US, the S&P for example, historically returned around 10% per year. Now let's move on to person two. That person might say, I'm gonna pay off all my college loans, I'm gonna put a down payment on a house, I'm gonna get my kids in a private school or whatever they need to do. And they're gonna start saving not 5,000 a year, but 10,000 a year, investing in that same index fund. And as you can see in the graph, the early bird, so to speak, got the worm, that the person saving only 5,000 a year, but starting early, 
wound up with roughly $2.5 million, more than double the person that saved 10,000 a year but started late. So whatever age you are, you know, you can start investing today and just be disciplined and keep saving each year. Another example of kind of building wealth, and I think all of us have become more savvy shoppers these days, especially kind of shopping from home. And my point is this, uh, it may not be immediately obvious to you, but clearly if you work and you earn income, that's great, but you're paying 25 to 50% of that income to the government in taxes. Conversely, if you spend less money, that goes dollar to dollar to increase your net worth to your bottom line. So here's just a simple example. Let's say I'm in the market for a Fitbit, and most of us would probably just go to amazon.com or maybe Fitbit website. But you can see here, I went to Google Shopping or Google Shopper, it's a website that you can use where it searches the web, and you can see the cheapest it found was $86 versus 150 at Bed Bath & Beyond. That's almost a 50% difference. So being smart about your shopping, I think is increasingly important uh, these days. Let's talk a little bit about interest rates. I mentioned that they're near record lows and uh, many of us you know, are, are living in New Jersey. Uh, obviously you can be viewing this presentation from anywhere, but my point is this, it might be a pretty good time to refinance your mortgage if you haven't done so, or on the flip side, if you're looking at buying a house, it's probably a good time. So uh, in the US, the median house basically is around 300,000, but New Jersey is a higher cost area. The median house price is closer to 500,000. So let's say you're able to put 20% down either with a new purchase or refinancing. About a year ago or so, mortgage rates were around 4%. Currently, they're about 2.75%. So it's a 1.25% drop. So what would that result in with your mortgage payment with refinancing? You can see here the before payment was almost 2000, 1910 to be exact. After refinancing, your payment would be 1633. Using round numbers, that's roughly saving $300 a month. I multiply that by 12, that's $3,600 a year. So obviously there, there are some closing costs when you refinance a mortgage or purchase a mortgage like title insurance, attorney fees. And the bottom line is this, if you expect to be in your house for more than a year, Refinancing probably does make a lot of sense at this time, and I would encourage you to do so. Let's talk a little bit more about real estate. Uh, Margaret mentioned at the top of the lecture, if you joined us a little bit late, that I've taken several trips with Rutgers students to see Warren Buffett. If you're a follower of the news, you might know that he turned 90 years old yesterday, so happy birthday to Warren Buffett. And you can see this quote here, he says, all things considered, the third best investment he ever made was the purchase of his home. If you're curious, the first two best purchases were the engagement slash wedding rings for his wives. When his first wife passed away, he was remarried about 15 years ago. And he goes on to talk about how he's had great memories in his home. It's good to own your own home. So let me elaborate on this a little bit. So Usually numerically, it makes sense that if you expect to live somewhere at least a few years, because of these closing and other costs I alluded to, owning your own home is usually a wise investment. Uh, number one, there's some tax advantages, even though they've been reduced in recent years. So for example, interest payments on debt are tax deductible, property taxes are tax deductible, now the cap is close to 10,000, but there's still something. And by paying rent, you're essentially throwing money away. You're building equity for a landlord and not building equity for yourself. Uh, and other things in terms of what results in high appreciation, I'm sure you've all heard that expression about real estate location, location, location. So what does that mean? Well, clearly, if you have some school-aged children, being in an area with good schools, let's say the Milburn area in New Jersey or Princeton, uh, that's historically good for real estate appreciation. Close to New York City, when people commuted in the city, I'm sure that will start up once again at some point in the future. An easy commute, regardless of where you're uh, living, uh, living. Being in a desirable area, many people have been going to the shore lately here in the East Coast, the Jersey Shore and Hamptons are popular. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're looking at both a primary residence and I'll talk a little bit about investment properties on this next slide. 
So somebody might say, okay, I have some stocks, have some bonds, have some money in the bank. What else can I do to diversify my, my portfolio? Well, real estate is one thing you can do. Uh, the lowest cost thing you can do is buy something called a real estate investment trust or REIT. If you're not familiar with that term, it's kind of real estate that trades like a stock. What happens is it's kind of like a fund and the managers buy uh, elements or pieces of real estate and you would own a tiny piece of that. So the prices of these REITs range from $5, for example, to $100. So anyone can kind of afford that. And another good thing is that they pay significant income. So I mentioned interest rates right now are 1% or less. REITs typically are paying 4 to 5%. That's the good news. The bad news is that REITs have stock market volatility. So if you can't stomach the volatility, a REIT may not be for you. You can invest in private real estate partnerships. Uh, the investment is typically much more, typically six figures and higher. Uh, one downside is that because you're owning physical real estate, there's often a long-term lockup. Your money's locked up for five to 10 years. So I would only recommend this for a, a small portion of your portfolio that can be illiquid. I'm not sure about your family, but our family is, is fond of these real estate shows that we see on TV like Flip or Flop. And, you know, I do have some investing experience in these areas. It's possible, but not as easy as it sounds, mainly because uh, unless you're very handy in doing everything your, yourself, you have to manage contractors. And that's not easy. Number one, you have to know what a fair price is. And two, often contractors are juggling multiple jobs and may not finish everything on time. In addition, and this is important, for the best deals, you often have to pay in cash in full upfront. And there aren't a lot of people walking around with three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in cash. Specifically, if you're going to buy bank owned real estate or buy at an auction, you got to pay up in cash in full. You could also do rental properties, which I think is a good way to, to earn income, but it's not without its risks. Number one, you have to deal with tenants, deal with repairs. Uh, during times like right now with COVID-19, a lot of people aren't paying their rent. Of course, you can hire a property manager. Rough rule of thumb is that they're paying about you're paying about 10% or maybe one month's rent, which would be you know, close to 12%. So that's a challenge as well. But bottom line, real estate is typically the part of most high net worth investor portfolios, and you can decide which way is best for you. Let me kind of wrap up with a, a slide on Warren Buffett and then we'll kind of open it up for Q&A. And this mostly applies to buying stocks or maybe investing in private businesses. And one question I'm often asked is, what kind of firm should I invest in? Well, Buffett has this expression, invest in your circle of competence. Now, circle of competence could be the area that you work in or it could be an area that you know well. So for example, let's say you're a, a cooking aficionado or you like to eat at restaurants, well, you might know that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Starbucks, for example, has been a great restaurant or a firm like Darden. So circle of competence is an area where you have a deep amount of knowledge, either because of work or just personal interest. If you find that you have no circle of competence, which is fine for a lot of average investors, the simplest thing to do that Buffett recommends is buying an index fund. He calls it kind of buying a piece of America, and of course, there's no guarantee the returns will be what they were in the past. But since the 1920s, or really we have data going back to the 1870s, that number has been roughly 10% per year, which is pretty attractive, especially given where interest rates are right now. Another thing you should do, uh, taking a page out of Buffett's book, is investing for the long term. Number one, having a long term mindset will help you avoid some of these mistakes of chasing hot investments and then panicking. Here's a Buffett quote, my favorite holding period is forever. He's owned Coca-Cola for decades, American Express for decades. Apple is one of his newer positions and he, that's doing you know extremely well. We, Tyler and I talked a little about market psychology or investor psychology and you want to be aware of what your psychology is and try not to get swept up in the uh, fear or panic, as well as the euphoria or when a bull market is in full swing. Here's perhaps Buffett's most famous quote, be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. At this point, I'd say the market is probably tilting towards the greed side of the spectrum. I don't think it's as bad as it was in like 1999 with the internet bubble, when almost everything was overvalued. But 
know, there are some very pockets of expensive stocks in the market. Uh, another thing that we can learn from taking a page out of Buffett's book is buying companies, he calls it having a strong or wide moat. Uh, in economic terms, these firms have a very strong competitive position, barriers to competition. Let me use an example that Buffett likes to talk about, Coca-Cola, right? They're the largest seller of non-alcoholic beverages in the world. Anybody can make soda. You and I can make soda with our soda stream machine, but Coca-Cola's advantage is that they're in 200 countries, they have great marketing and distribution, your soda's not gonna get a restaurant contract at McDonald's, it's not gonna get great space on the supermarket shelf at ShopRite or Kroger or Wegmans, wherever you like to shop. So these are just some investing lessons that we can take away. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions you have on health and wealth, and thanks for joining us, and I'll pass it back to Margaret, who will moderate this next session. What a great session. Thank you, you guys. That was fantastic. So our audience has submitted a few questions, and I think this one is going to, the first one is going to be for uh, Kim, because it goes back to when you were talking about the cent centarians. Mm -hmm. um, why are the areas with increased centarians called blue zones? So um, that is, has an interesting answer. We learned that the researchers who were looking at what areas of the world had the highest percentage of people who lived to 100 and beyond marked those areas with a blue marker. So when they were preparing to write up their results, they said, what should we call it? Um, that's where the blue so zone came from. And because they had blue markers marking those areas. Um, so they said if, well, if the researcher had had a red marker, they might have been called the red zones. That's where it comes from. <laughs> I love that. That's so funny. Um, when uh, you always should think about what the simplest answer is to any question, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's see. Um, next is uh, the stock market is at or near record highs, but the economy is still having problems. Um, where is the disconnect? It's a good question. So as I briefly alluded to, the stock market is not the economy. The stock market is a group of large companies. And specifically, if you see how the index is created, so not to get too much into the weeds, but the S&P 500 is called a market cap weighted index. This means that the most expensive companies in terms of the value, Apple's about 2 trillion. Amazon's about 1.6 trillion, Google's over a trillion, Microsoft 1.5 trillion. These companies have actually benefited in some respects from the pandemic. I know our, shop, our family's shopping a lot more on Amazon. So these large mega cap companies have done extremely well, uh, even better than normally, while the average company, especially your small business, is, is having a lot harder problems. I mean, just think about all the people in your ecosystem, your local restaurant, your hairdresser, whoever's in your ecosystem, I think they're having a, a lot more difficulty. In addition, as I alluded to, the market tends to look ahead. It kind of discounts what's happening now. And the current view, whether it's rightly or wrongly, is that we're going to get through this. At some point, there's going to be a vaccine. At some point, there's going to be herd uh, immunization. And we're going to get past this, even though we're in for a rocky ride short term. So. Yeah, the stock market's not the economy. That's probably the simple explanation. That, that's great. And it's, I think it's something that's really important for people to know and understand. Um, so I have a question uh, for Tyler. Um, what do you think parents should do to help make their, their kids uh, financially literate? Um, well, I think it's really important to first understand the ideas of supply and demand. And the idea that for every transaction, there's there's a buyer and a seller, and it's these marginal transactions that, that fuel the stock market and the American economy as a whole. And I think that's a really important foundation to establish. Fantastic. I, I think you're in, in really good hands, Tyler. I really do. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I have a, a couple of uh, more health questions came in. Um, so. Uh, this person says there are certainly benefits to people who are sick wearing a mask because that prevents the spread of COVID. But um, what's the benefit of healthy people wearing masks? Does it help them prevent getting infected? Um, 
there may be a small benefit there, but um, one, uh, one reason it's so important is that many people may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and not realizing that they actually are um, potentially spreading the infection. And we don't have a good way to test this. So that's um, why it's most important. Um, really the protecting for the individual um, if everyone could have an N95 mask, that would be wonderful. Um, there may be some modest effect to wearing, um, you know, the cotton masks, but not as, as much. Okay. Um, so let's see. Next question is about um, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, is it as good coming from canned or only fresh product? The... Fresh is best, um, but there are, again, the sardines, for example, that, that you can often get in um, package, in, canned, um, that still have good omega-3s in them. Okay, good. Um, okay, and I'm not sure whether to direct this to Tyler or to John, but do you think growth or value investments will outperform looking ahead? Tyler, you want to take that first? Um, okay. Um... I think it's extremely hard to draw conclusions about growth and value as a whole. And this this type of analysis is much more effective when researching individual companies at, at the individual level. And there, there are value stocks such as, uh, I guess, JP Morgan or Bank of America with PE ratios around 12, that's, that's considered low. And they seem due for an upswing, but there are also many high quality growth stocks such as Amazon that also show no signs of going down in the near future. So, I mean, growth versus value, it's an important characteristic of a company, but it, it doesn't tell much about future performance and you can't determine much what, on that alone. I'd agree with Tyler. I mean, the actual investment that you're owning, I think makes a lot of sense. Just to maybe give a, a more precise answer in some respects that I know many of you have like a retirement plan and can only select growth or value and can't pick a name like a JP Morgan. Uh, in the short run, what has gone up, we call it momentum, tends to keep working. So I'm guessing these high quality growth stocks are probably going to do well through the end of the year. But kind of the disparity, and Tyler had a slide on this between growth and value performance, it's kind of at an all time high. So if I'm looking ahead over the next few years, I think maybe tilting towards uh, value is probably a good longer term way to go, despite the continued momentum that growth names have. Fantastic. Um, Kim, I did not write this question, but I easily could have because <laughs> this falls into my realm of, of questions. Um, with people spending so much time outdoors, um, recreation, dining, things like that, um, what should our audience know about proper sun protection and sunscreen? Right. So, the basics involve just being aware of, you know, if you can avoid the sun in the peak hours, you know, around noon, that's important. And then um, being careful about knowing that, for example, an umbrella or shade is not sufficient. There are ultraviolet rays that sort of bounce off and, and affect your skin, even if you're in the shade. Um, so it is a good idea to, if you are going to be outdoors, to wear your hat, your sunglasses, your sun protective clothing, and then use um, a general, if you're just going outdoors day to day, a moisturizer that has some SPF in it for day to day use. And then if you're going to be um, out longer in the heat or exercising using a water resistant 80 minute um, labeled sunscreen and reapplying it according to the labeling. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump back to the uh, financial side of um, our presentation, and that this question says, do you think that we already have seen um, the most of the extremes of the market losses related to COVID, um, or, um, I'm sorry, especially since despite some increasing cases a few months ago, the market was still increasing? So yeah, let me try to tackle that. So. In around seven out of 10 cases, the market tends to test or approach those historical lows. In this case, it seems unlikely, mainly because of the very forceful response we've seen um, from the Fed and government. So we didn't really talk about this, but 
the Fed has pumped trillions of dollars into the system, and that's helped keeping at least the stock market and, and some elements of the economy afloat. As you know, Congress passed a very large fiscal package, and they're working on another one where incredibly checks in the mail of $1,200 were sent to many Americans. So I would say we're unlikely to, to go back to those March and April lows, but uh, I think the market has you know, gone up quite a bit. And you know, if I had new money coming into the market, I would just gradually leg that in on a dollar cost averaging basis. Once again, looking out long term, I, I think the market is a place where you want to be because as I said, interest rates are low. If you're getting almost zero, putting your money in bank, in the, in the bank, people say, okay, I can't get zero forever. And that money eventually makes its way back into the stock market and real estate and other risky assets. So I would say the easy money has been made, but long-term equities are probably still a good place to be. Fantastic. I'm gonna to toss the last question to, uh, to Kim. And uh, I think this is reflective of the, you know, the cooling temperatures and more people potentially spending time indoors. Would you recommend some type of air circulation in homes um, as we approach the the winter? Um, I'm not sure as a, <laughs> I have a great answer to that, but of course, you know, uh, obviously fresh air is better than recirculated air and good filters. I know we just uh, updated our um, air filter in our uh, furnace air conditioning. It had been, it's something that anyone can um, readily do or ask for help or watch a YouTube video to do to um, watch that your filter, if it hasn't, if you haven't you can't remember the last time you changed it, it's something to go ahead and do to uh, increase the quality of the air that's recirculating circulating indoors. Oh, very, very good point. And there's nothing really bad about cold air to be outside in the winter. Anyway, I mean, I know you can't sit outside and have like a full meal, but right, there's nothing bad about outdoor cold no, air. No, not at all. Yeah, all right, good. Then my parents were giving me good advice all that time when they would say, go outside and play, go outside, <laughs> no yeah. matter what the weather. Right. Um, excellent. Well, I want to thank um, you guys so much. Um, this was really exciting to have our first family um, presentation. And as you had indicated, it's very representative of, you know, of the current times. So, um, but I'd like to thank uh, you guys. I'd like to also thank our audience. We had some great questions come in, made it uh, a really interesting discussion. And we jumped around a bit because we were covering both, you know, uh, health and wealth. But I think that's our, our reality, too. We have to take both of those into consideration in our in our personal lives. So, um, but I just wanted to um, mention uh, that we uh, host our virtual lunch and learn series. It's usually on Wednesdays at noon Eastern time, but as you can see, we do occasionally deviate uh, from the, from that schedule. Um, but uh, we hope that you'll join us for the next one. Um, you can uh, see our future webinar schedule at business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. We recognize that's a long URL. So for those who were attended today, we'll also be emailing you about our, our, um, our future topics. Speaking of our future topics, um, we, um, we've had our great schedule because of your comments and suggestions. So we encourage you to keep sharing your thoughts with us so the series can continue to meet your evolving needs. So please stay online for just a moment longer as today's webinar ends because you'll immediately see a very brief three-question survey. And one of those questions is a free-form field to type in any topics or speakers you'd like to see featured in the future. And lastly, as I mentioned when our webinar began, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed to you. It'll also be on the Business Insights page of our website. And now really, really lastly, we have been closing our webinars with a component called the 1000 Laptop Challenge. Our students and their families have endured financial hardships since COVID-19 rocked all of our worlds. They quickly entered a remote learning environment that required technology such as laptops that many simply can't afford. Corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors can help by donating to the 1000 Laptop Challenge Fund. You'll receive an email with more information about how you can be part of this important initiative and a link to the donation webpage. And we appreciate your kind support.
So everyone, I just want to thank you um, and uh, wish you the best um, health and wealth. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.